Hare Krishna, Tandavat Pranam to all the devotees. Today we will continue reading from the book The Path of Perfection by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhakti Vedan Swami Srila Prabhupada. We are reading chapter number 5 Determination and Steadiness in Yoga. As stated before, this determination can be attained only by one who does not indulge in sex. Celibacy makes one's determination strong. Therefore, from the very beginning, Krishna states that the yogi does not engage in sex. If one indulges in sex, one's determination will be flickering. Therefore, sex life should be controlled according to rules and regulations governing the grahastha ashram or sex should be given up altogether. Actually, it should be given up altogether, but if that is not possible, it should be controlled. Then determination will come because after all, determination is a bodily affair. Determination means continuing to practice Krishna consciousness with patience and perseverance. If one does not immediately attain the desired results, one should not think, Oh, what is this Krishna consciousness? I will give it up. No, we must have determination and faith in Krishna's words. In this regard, there is a mundane example. When a young girl gets married, she immediately hankers for a child. She thinks, now I am married, I must have a child immediately. But how is that possible? The girl must have patience, become a faithful wife, serve her husband and let her love grow. Eventually, because she is married, it is certain that she will have a child. Similarly, when we are in Krishna consciousness, our perfection is guaranteed. But we must have patience and determination. We should think, I must execute my duties and should not be impatient. Impatience is due to loss of determination and loss of determination is due to excessive sex. The yogi should be determined and should patiently prosecute Krishna consciousness without deviation. One should be sure of success at the end and pursue this course with great perseverance, not becoming discouraged if there is any delay in attainment of success. Success is sure for a rigid practitioner. Regarding Bhakti Yoga, Rupa Goswami says, Utsahan nishchayat dhairyat tat tat karma pravat tanat Sangha Tyagat Satovrate Sadbhir Bhaktir Prasidhyati, which means the process of Bhakti Yoga can be executed successfully with full hearted enthusiasm, perseverance, and determination by following the prescribed duties in association of devotees and by engaging completely in activities of goodness. Upadeshamrit 3. As for determination, one should follow the example of the sparrow who lost her eggs in the waves of the ocean. A sparrow laid her eggs on the shore of ocean, but the big ocean carried away the eggs on the waves. The sparrow became very upset and asked the ocean to return her eggs. The ocean did not even consider her appeal. So the sparrow decided to dry up the ocean. She began to pick up water in a small beak and everyone laughed at her for doing the impossible determination. The news of her activity spread and when last Garuda, the gigantic bird carrier of Lord Vishnu heard it, he became compassionate towards this little bird and so he came to see her. Garuda was very pleased by the termination of the small sparrow and he promised to help. Thus Garuda at once asked the ocean to return her eggs lest he himself take up the work of the sparrow. The ocean was frightened by this and returned the eggs. Thus the sparrow became happy by the grace of Garuda. Similarly, the practice of yoga, especially Bhakti Yoga and Krishna Consciousness may appear as a difficult job, but if anyone follows the principles with great determination, the Lord will surely help, for God helps those who help themselves. Sanhai Sanir Uparamet Buddhya Dhrit Gritya Atma Samsthan Mana Kritva Na Kinchit Api Chintayet which means gradually, step by step, one should become situated in trance by means of intelligence sustained by full conviction and thus the mind should be fixed on the self alone and should think of nothing else. As stated in Bhagavad Gita chapter 6 verse 25. We are the self and Krishna is also the self. When there is sunlight, we can see the sun and ourselves also. 
However, when there is dense darkness, we sometimes cannot see our own body. Although the body is there, the darkness is so dense that I cannot see myself. But when the sunshine is present, I can see myself as well as the sun. Similarly, seeing the self means first of all seeing the supreme self Krishna. In the Katha Upanishad it is stated Nityo Nityanam Chetanas Chetananam The self, the supreme self is the chief eternal of all eternals and he is the chief living being of all living beings. Krishna consciousness means fixing the mind on Krishna and when the mind is thus fixed, it is fixed on the complete whole. If the stomach is cared for and supplied nutritious food, all the bodily limbs are nourished and we are in good health. Similarly, if the water, if we water the root of a tree, all the branches, leaves, flowers and twigs are automatically taken care of. By rendering service to Krishna, we automatically render the best service to all others. As stated before, a Krishna conscious person does not sit down idly. He knows that Krishna consciousness is such an important philosophy that it should be distributed. Therefore, the members of this society are not just sitting in the temple but are going out on Sankirtan parties, preaching and distributing the supreme philosophy. That is the mission of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his disciples. Other yogis may be satisfied with their own elevation and sit in secluded places practicing yoga. For them, yoga is nothing more than personal concern. A devotee, however, is not satisfied just in elevating his personal self. Vancha kalpata rubhasya kripa sindhu bhaevacha patitanam pavanebhyo vishnanebhyo namo namaha I offer my respectful obeisances unto all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord who can fulfill the desires of everyone just like desired trees and who are full of compassion for the fallen souls. A devotee displays great compassion towards conditioned souls. The word Kripa means mercy and Sindhu means ocean. A devotee is an ocean of mercy and he naturally wants to distribute this mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, for instance, was God conscious, Krishna conscious, but he was not satisfied in keeping this knowledge within himself. Had he continued to live alone in God consciousness, he would not have met crucifixion. But no, being a devotee and naturally compassionate, he also wanted to take care of others by making them God conscious. Although he was forbidden to preach God consciousness, he continued to do so at the risk of his own life. That is the nature of a devotee. It is therefore stated in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, from verse 68 to 69, that the devotee who preaches is most dear to the Lord. Ya idam paramam khoyam mad bhakteshva abhidhasyati bhaktim mai param kratva mam avesyati asam sayaha. For one who explains the supreme secrets to a devotee's devotional service is guaranteed, and at the end he will come back to me. Nacha tasman manusyesu kashchin me priya kritamaha bhavita nacha me tasmad anya priya taro bhuvi, which means there is no servant of this world more dear to me than he nor will there be anyone more dear. Therefore, the devotee goes out to preach and going forth, they sometimes meet opposing elements. Sometimes they are defeated, sometimes disappointed, sometimes able to convince and sometimes not. It is not that every devotee is well equipped to preach. Just as there are different types of people, there are three class of devotees. In the, three cla- in the third class are those who have no faith. If they are engaged in devotional service officially, for some ulterior purpose, they cannot achieve the highest perfectional stage. Most probably, they will slip after some time. They may become engaged, but because they haven't complete conviction and faith, it is very difficult for them to continue in Krishna consciousness. We have practical experiences in discharging our missionary activity that some people come and apply themselves to Krishna consciousness with hidden motive and as soon as they economically a little well situated they give up the process and take their own ways again. It is only by faith that one can advance in Krishna consciousness. As far as development of faith is concerned, one who is well versed in literatures of devotional service and has attained the stage 
of firm faith is called a first class person in krishna consciousness and in second class are those who are not very advanced in understanding the devotional scriptures but who are automatically having faith in krishna bhakti or service to krishna and is the best course and so in good faith have taken it up thus they are superior to the third class who have neither perfect knowledge of the scripture nor good faith but by association and simplicity are trying to follow the third class person krishna consciousness may fall down but when one is in second class or first class he does not fall down one in the first class will surely make progress and achieve the result at the end as far as third class person in krishna consciousness is concerned although he has faith in the conviction that devotional service to krishna is good he has no knowledge of krishna through the scriptures like trimad bhagavatam and bhagavad gita sometimes these third class persons in krishna consciousness have tendency towards karma yoga or nyana yoga and sometimes they are dis- disturbed but as soon as the infection of karma yoga or nyana yoga is vanquished they become second class or first class persons in krishna consciousness Faith in Krishna is also divided in three stages as described in Srimad Bhagavatam. First class attachment, second class attachment and third class attachment are explained in Srimad Bhagavatam in 11th canto. However, one is situated. One should have determination to go out and preach Krishna consciousness. That endeavor should at least be there and one who so attempts to preach renders the best service to the Lord. Despite opposition, one should attempt to elevate people to the highest standard of self-realization. One who has actually seen the truth, who is in trance of self-realization, cannot sit idly. He must come out. Ramanujacharya, for instance, declared the Hare Krishna mantra publicly. He did not distribute it secretly for some fee. Recently, an Indian yogi came to yoga, came to America to give some private mantra. But if a mantra has power, why should it be private? If a mantra is powerful, why should it not be publicly declared so that everyone can take advantage of it? We are saying that Krishna, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra can save everyone and we are therefore distributing it publicly, free of charge. But in this age, people are so foolish that they are not prepared to accept it. Rather, they hanker after some secret mantra and therefore pay some yogi $35 or whatever for some private mantra. This is because people want to be cheated, but devotees are preaching without charge, declaring in the streets, parks and everywhere. Here, here is the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Come and take it. But under the spell of Maya illusion, people are thinking, oh, this is not good. But if you charge something and bluff and cheat, people will follow you. In this regard, there is a Hindi verse saying that Kali Yuga is such an abominable stage that if one speaks the truth, people will come and beat him. But if one cheats, bluffs and lies, people will be bewildered, will like it and accept it. If I say I am God, people will say, oh here is Swamiji, here is God. In this age, people don't have sufficient brain power to inquire. How have you become God? What are the symptoms of God? Do you have all these symptoms? Because people do not make such inquiries, they are cheated. Therefore, it is necessary to be fixed in consciousness of self. Unless one knows and understands the real self and the super self, one will be cheated. Real yoga means understanding this process of self-realization. Yato yato nischalati manas chanchalam astiram tatas tato niyam yetat atmani eva vasam nayet which means from wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back to control of the self as mentioned in Srimad Bhagavad Gita chapter 6 verse 26 this is the real yogic process if you are trying to concentrate your mind on Krishna and the mind is diverted wandering to some cinema or wherever you should withdraw the mind thinking no not there please here this is yoga not allowing the mind to wander from krishna very intense training is required to keep the mind fixed on krishna while sitting in one place that is very hard work indeed if one is not if one is not so practiced and tries to manipulate tries to imitate this process he will surely be confused instead we always have to encourage and engage ourselves in Krishna consciousness 
dovetailing everything we do to Krishna. Our usual activities should be molded that they are rendered for Krishna's sake. In this way, the mind will remain fixed on Krishna. As stated before, we should not try to sit down and stare at the tip of our nose. At the present moment, attempts to engage in that type of yoga is artificial. Rather, the recommended method is chanting loudly and hearing Hare Krishna. Then, even if the mind is diverted, it will be forced to concentrate on the sound vibration of Krishna. It is necessary to withdraw the mind from everything. It will automatically be withdrawn because it will be concentrated on the sound vibration. If we hear an automobile pass, our attention will automatically be diverted. Similarly, if we constantly chant Hare Krishna, our mind will automatically be fixed on Krishna. Although we are accustomed to think of so many other things. The nature of the mind is flickering and unsteady, but a self-realized yogi has to control the mind. The mind should not control him. At the present moment, the mind is controlling us. Godasa. The mind is telling us, please, why not look at that beautiful girl? And so we look. It says, why not drink that nice liquor? And we say, yes. It says, why not smoke that cigarette? Yes, we say. But why not go to this restaurant for such palatable food? Why not do this? Why not do that? In this way, the mind is dictating and we are following. Material life means being controlled by senses of the mind, which is the center of all senses. Being controlled by the mind means being controlled by the senses because the senses are mind's assistance. The master mind dictates, go see that, and the eyes following the direction of the mind look at the object. The mind tells us to go to a certain place and the legs under the direction of the mind carry us there. Thus, being under the direction of the mind means coming under direction of senses. If we can control the mind, we will not be under the control of senses. One who is under the control of senses is known as Godasa. The word Go means senses and Dasa means servant. One who is master of the senses is called Goswami because Swami means master. Therefore, one who has the title Goswami is one who has mastered the senses. As long as one is servant of senses, he cannot be called Goswami or Swami. Unless one masters the senses, his acceptance of the title Swami or Goswami is just a form of cheating. It was Rupa Goswami who does define the meaning of the word Goswami. Originally, Sanatan Goswami and Rupa Goswami were not Goswamis but were government ministers. It was only when they became disciples of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that they became Goswamis. So Goswami is not a hereditary title but a qualification. One becomes so qualified under the direction of a bona fide spiritual master. Only when one has attained perfection in sense control can be called a Goswami and become a spiritual master in his turn, unless one can master the senses, he will simply be a bogus spiritual master. This is explained by Rupa Goswami in his Upadesh Amrita 1. Vacho Vegam Manasaha Krodha Vegam Jiva Vegam Udaro Pashtha Vegam Etan Vegam Yo Visheta Dhira Sarva Apimam Prithivim Sa Sisyat which means a sober person who can tolerate the urge to speak, the mind's demands, the urges, the action of anger and the urges of the tongue, belly and genitals is qualified to make disciples all over the world. In this verse, Rupa Goswami mentions six pushings, Vegam. This pushing is a kind of impetus. For instance, when nature calls, we have to go to the toilet and we cannot check this urge. So this urge is called Vegam, a kind of pushing. According to Rupa Goswami, there are six Vegams. Vacho Vegam is the urge to talk unnecessarily, that is a kind of push of the tongue. Then there is Krodha Vegam, the urge to become angry. When we are pushed to anger, we cannot check ourselves and sometimes men become so angry that they commit murder. Similarly, the mind is pushing, dictating, you must go here and there and we immediately go. The word Jiva Vegam refers to tongue being urged to taste palatable foods. Udhara Vegam refers to urges of the belly. Although the belly is full, it still wants more food and that is kind of pushing the belly. And when we yield to pushing of tongue and belly, the urge of genitals become very strong and sex is required. If one does not control his mind or tongue, he cannot control his genitals. In this way, there are many pushings, so much so that the body is kind of a pushing machine. Rupa Goswami therefore tells us that one can become a spiritual master only when he can control all these urges. 
सर्व अपी माम पृथ्वीम ससित वन हू कैन कंट्रोल द पुशिंग्स एंड रिमेन स्टडी कैन मेक डिसाइपल्स ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड